What up, gang? This is Ken Zerk, Ken Zilli, Gizika Milligan, the villain, Phil and Trilligan, and we are back on Umi Neko no Nako Korum Ni. Last episode. Fuck, man. Fuck. Fuck, man. Okay, Kana was confirmed dead. And we got another letter from the witch. Fuck, a lot of shit happened, but we got another letter from the witch. Um, All the servants and Mario were chased out. We're holding ourselves up in Kenzo's study. And basically, it turns out all of the deaths are following the path of the epitaph. So, hey, they scared as fuck. They scared as thing. They're scared as fuck. After we chased them out, nobody wanted to say anything. All of the suspicious ones had been dr driven away. Even though we knew there might be some innocence among them, we still did it. We chased them out of this paradise where people don't have to suspect each other. But our motive from chasing them out was suspicion of one person towards another, the worst kind of crime for a human. If we had accepted the existence of a 19th person, of the witch, then we all might be still talking face to face, trusting in each other. In that instant, we had agreed to chase out all of the suspicious people. But had that been the right thing to do? During this endless silence, we could do nothing but quietly be tormented by that sin. Unannounced, we faced the door without letting go of her rifle for even an instant, sitting far back in the sofa. She would probably spend the night staring at the door without a wink of sleep. George gazed through, gazed through a gap in the closed curtains by the window, looking down at the courtyard and at the, man, and the mansion that surrounded it. I didn't know whether he was checking to see if a suspicious shadow would be visible through the window, or whether he was wondering to himself about something. Jessica was sitting sideways on the sofa next to Ainatsui, with a dead expression on her face. And every once in a while, as though she just remembered something, she'd take out an inhaler she had used during her asthma attack and stick it in her mouth. I just heard it from Anaki. But apparently Jessica liked Kana. I imagine so, yeah. Yeah, I figured, I figured. It was apparently so vague that she hadn't realized it herself, you know. It's the kind of thing other people tend to spot before the person in question realizes it. Which means... She might have first learned of her feelings when the person she liked died. It must have been so terrible, so sad. Come to think of it. Connor was the one who handed her that inhaler. Maybe she was remembering that. I was fishing around Grandfather's study, thinking I'd research the meaning of the magic circle on the letter's second sheet. Even though we were shut up here in a defensive position, my rebellious nature made me want to find some key, some way to resist. After all, we've got plenty of time before tomorrow morning. Who could fault me on how I use that time? No one showed them much interest in this magic circle. Its meaning was unknown, and once we understood it, we were sure to find some message that would cause us unnecessary anguish. I felt the same way. However, I couldn't ignore it, so I killed time by going through the motions of researching it. You sure are enthusiastic. Did you find anything that might serve as a hint? Not a thing. The first, the first tough part of finding a book written in Jap, the first tough part is finding a book written in Japanese. Just how many languages could Grandfather read? He's incredible. Aren't you tired, Battler? You should take a rest while someone else stays awake. Anatsu said she'd stay up all night for us, but there's no way her body can handle that. We should take turns sleeping. Then you sleep first, Aniki. I'll keep research until I get sleepy. You mean that magic circle just now? Yeah. We've got plenty of time to kill. I thought it'd be interesting to find out what kind of message Beatrice put in it. Give it a rest. Mess around with stuff like that and you'll end up getting possessed by something weird. Don't worry. I've been certified by Maria. She said I've got no spiritual talent at all. Maria 
Were we too cruel to Maria? Jessica, you mustn't think that now. But mom, if Maria wasn't involved and there's a culprit besides her, then she's obviously a soft target for the murderer. If she's killed because of this, then we've just left her to die. A gloomy silence settled once again. It looked like Jessica regretted letting her emotions take hold of her and snapping at Maria. She's always been like that, always acting tough and regretting it later. I understand how you feel, but Maria was in close contact with the culprit, and she might have been siding with them, talking like that over and over to further confuse matters. I am relieved that we chased them out. That's pretty harsh on Natsui. Couldn't it have just been the nonsense of a nine-year-old girl? It probably wasn't very convincing hearing that coming from me. I myself thought Maria was creepy on several occasions, even doubting her true nature. And when Maria was chased out the room, I couldn't deny I felt some relief. If that is the case, then tomorrow we will apologize for what we did. I will take full responsibility for chasing them out of this room. This isn't something the rest of you have to worry about. I could feel a tragic determination in Aunt Natsui's words. To protect her own daughter, she had to resolutely chase out. She had resolutely chased out the suspicious ones. And if, as a result, she had to watch the people who had unfortunately been suspected die, so be it. She was prepared to take full responsibility. Why did Maria have to keep saying stuff like that? She's bringing about her own ruin. I think the reason Maria adores witches and magic so much might be on Rosa. On Rosa? What does she have to do with this? Didn't you realize it too, Badalu? Maria's real father ran off somewhere a long time ago. Although on Rosa tried to confuse the issue by saying he's on a foreign business trip. Talking about Rosa's family has become kind of taboo in the Ashiramiya family. I think Aunt Rosa thought about remarrying, but I also believe Maria may have become her shackles and made that quite difficult. After all, she sometimes got really emotional and hit Maria. I agree with you there. It looked like Aunt Rosa was trying hard to like Maria, which means that she didn't really like her. She might have thought of Maria as someone who stood in the way of her remarrying. I think that emotional rejection from her mother might have left some deep scars on her young heart. So she learned about this occult hobby from somewhere and immersed herself in it to bury the holes in her heart. Did you know, to Maria, the image of a witch isn't negative at all. Remember yesterday at the beach when she showed us her notebook? Yeah, it was full of those fun-looking scribbles. Yesterday when we were down by the beach doubting the witch, Maria got all riled up and started explaining about witches. And not one of those pages has shown a picture of an ugly witch. They were all brightly colored, beautiful, cute witches who looked like they were having fun. There was absolutely nothing sinister about them, like a boy might have imagined. They were beings adorned in beautiful dresses, who could grant anyone's dreams with their mysterious magic and who made everyone happy. The sorrow of not being loved by her mother. Had Maria sought help from witches as beings who could give her happiness and save her? Someday a witch would come and using her wonderful magic would bring Maria happiness. Even though she believed that as she grew older, older she had to face reality as her fleeting dreams were sliced to ribbons one by one. If something claiming to be the witch of Rock and Jima appeared in front of a girl like that, whispering that she'd take Maria to the golden land where Maria could be happy. I... Now that it's come to this, I want to confess what's in my heart. Throwing out Maria, no, Genji and the rest too, was probably the wrong thing to do, I think. It wasn't pleasant 
Since Jessica had been the one to face them and slam them with words of rejection, her conscience must be tormenting her a lot right now. Then how do you all explain that letter? No one, no one could have said it there except the four people standing behind us. I made sure of that with my own eyes. If those four are innocent, then how was that letter placed in a closed room with eight people? That's right. When you put it that way, those four really do seem suspicious. But it's all useless. Ah, uh, it's all useless! Useless? What is? Right. It might not be worth anything anymore, but let me spin the chessboard around again. In other words, if one of those four really was the culprit, isn't that weird? That's right. Wasn't setting that letter openly on the table the same as confessing that one of them was the culprit? You're right, that's weird. If they were gonna do it, you'd think they'd put it in a crack of the door, for example, to make it look like someone slipped it in from the outside. Of course. They should have known that they'd be suspected if they didn't make it look like the culprit was outside the room. Yeah, that's it exactly. If the culprit was one of those four, setting that letter right in the middle of the table would be both risky and meaningless. But, putting aside whatever trick was used to set it there, if we assume that the culprit is someone other than those four, in other words, someone who was outside the room, then they had a lot to gain from that letter. Enough battling. It's meaningless to discuss such matters now. Not so we quickly guess what I was getting at. No. Maybe she had thought of it long before I had and simply held her tongue. If the culprit's outside this room, then they'd be totally stuck the moment we shut ourselves up in this closed room like this. That's right. It's the same as my theory about how grandfather disappeared from this room, isn't it? The theory that grandfather left the room of his own accord. If the culprit used some tactic to lure him out, and grandfather left of his own accord then. Come to think of it, when we found the scorpion magic circle on the door now to the study, Maria said it herself. Beatrice couldn't get through this door. But she said, but she could induce someone to leave of their own accord. Which would mean we fell for the culprit's trap completely and sent out some new potential sacrifices. Genji and the rest aren't fools. When they try to protect themselves, they should find the next safest place after this room. They will definitely be able to hide themselves there. Anatsui hadn't answered the question. Anatsui herself had realized that if the culprit wasn't in our group then, back then, that letter would make sense as a trap. However, it wasn't worth the risk of calling back the people she had once thrown out. To Anatsui right now, her greatest and only duty was to protect the children. By her thinking, in order to do that, a few sacrifices were unavoidable. Nah. Hey, Anasui. Let me say something a little harsh, okay? At that time, what if by coincidence, Jessica had also been standing behind you? Would you have chased Jessica from this room too? Damn. It's true that a lot of brutal things have happened. But as a mother, you thought you should protect your daughter no matter what. Because of that duty, you chased them out, even though you knew that you'd eventually be held responsible for it. It's not like I'm condemning that. But, um, I was just thinking about what a great mother Jessica has. That's right. You've been dealing with these incidents since morning, and you've been pulling up. You've been pulling all of us along this whole time without losing your composure. If you were all, if you were all confused too, the rest of us would probably be in the culprit's grasp by now. So I think we all have you to thank. I love seeing Natsui get her flowers, man. She deserves so much more love. Thank you. So what you two are trying to say... Is that you want her to act as Maria's mother, too? I... 
always thought of Maria as a real little sister and adored her. And yet, a few things happened, we got a little confused. And I've said a lot of mean things to her, hurting her. Ma, please, let's stay together with Maria. No, everyone, There's, there was no culprit among us. The culprit in this case is the witch Beatrice, okay? So let's stop suspecting each other. Uh, not till we closed her eyes for a short while. Was she coping with her throbbing headache again, or was she thinking of something? You are my precious daughter, the one I finally received the whole 12 years after I married my husband. I would become the worst kind of demon to protect you. That was some pretty strong language at the end there. She realized very well that her words were an idealized view of what a mother should be. But even so, she was strongly resolved to protect her daughter, even if she had to become a demon. But that was her guilty conscience tormenting her. Today's been so long. So many things happened in one day, and we've been driven into a corner so thoroughly. I wonder if we have the right to greet tomorrow the way we are now. Th there it is. I found it. It's this magic circle. Inside the book I've been flipping through, I have found the same magic circle that had been drawn on a second sheet of the letter. George peered at it as well. This magic circle's name was the third magic circle of Mars. The Hebrew written on it was Psalm 77, verse 13 of the Old Testament. What God is as great as our God? The meaning of the magic circle was discord. Agitate internal divisions and cause the enemy to bring about their own downfall. Wait a sec. Seriously? Could there be a more fitting way to describe our current situation and mental state? We couldn't help but be stunned in the silence. So, this letter was a trap. How did they place it here? There wasn't anyone in the room except for the eight of us, right? Anyway, let's ignore how they got in here for now. The culprit was after just one thing. They wanted to spread the seeds of doubt inside this impregnable room and use us to throw out the sacrificial sheep out. In that case, they're after the people who went out of the room. Mom, what do we do? Those four are in danger. It wasn't surprising that Aunt Natsui remained unpleasantly silent. Even if this was all a trap by the culprit, even if the four who had been chased out of the room were in danger, it had nothing to do with the safety of the four people in here. And there was no way to prove the innocence of the four people we chased out. If we were willing to let them die, then we shouldn't leave this room no matter what. That way is safest. At that time, suddenly, the piercing sound of a phone rang through the room. It was the antique extension phone set on the table in Grandfather's study. It had rung right after we started talking about the letter being a trap. It was natural we think it was an SOS from the ones we chased out. But then Anatsui spoke. Wh why a phone call? The phone should have been broken down and unusable. That doesn't matter. If that's Mario calling for help. If the problem with the phones was the culprit's work in the first place, then this call is... probably... With that one sentence, the ring of the phone, which at once sounded like a scream for help, now started to sound like a ghastly lore for some from some unknown person. I nod so we hesitated over whether to pick up the receiver. Let's pick it up on Natsuhi. The phones might have been fixed for some reason. It could still be an urgent call from Maria and the rest. That's right. And if, if it's actually a call from the culprit, bring it on. Why don't we listen to what they've got to say? It's just a phone call. No matter what they babble through the receiver, it's not like it's going to hurt you. If you don't pick it up, then I will. I will take it. Hello? I stretched out my hand to take the receiver, but I'm not so we grabbed it before I could reach. We all held our breath trying to figure out who the person on the other end of the phone was. 
But for some reason, Aunt Natsui kept saying hello. A silent phone call? There's no way Maria and the others would do something so creepy. Which means, could this phone call possibly really be? Natsui stopped repeating hello and strained her ears because she thought she heard something far away on the other end of the receiver. What was that? Huh? Is someone... Singing? What do you mean, singing? I don't know. Faintly, from the other end of the phone, I could hear someone singing. I wonder what it could be. Give it here for a sec. Hello. I half forced the receiver from the stun on Aunt Natsui's hand and pressed it against my ear. At first, I didn't hear shit. But... Because I had been told about it beforehand, I noticed. It sounded far away from the receiver, rather than someone speaking in a quiet voice. And it sounded like a girl singing a song. That voice did sound like Maria's, but that just made the situation even more inexplicable. At the very least, the one who had made the phone call hadn't been Maria. After all, Maria was singing some song far away from the receiver. In that case, the one who made the phone call should have been Genji, Kumasawa, or Dr. Nanja. And yet they weren't saying anything. Why? For what reason? The person who made this phone call... Who was it? Hey! Hello! Who is it? Answer me! Is that Maria singing? Answer me! What's happening? What is it? I don't know. All I can say is, this is probably a trap and Maria's in trouble. Anatsui took the receiver again, but after yelling into it several more times, she realized she wasn't getting anywhere and hung up. After that, she dialed quickly, then she clicked her tongue. That's right, if the phones are working, we should be able to reach the police. But judging by Anatsui's reaction, the outside telephone line still didn't connect. Let's go. Even if we know it might be a trap, we have to go. Yeah, definitely. Jessica, Unnatsui, stay here. When Anaki and I tried to dash out, Unnatsui stopped us. Hold it. I cannot let you go alone. I will go too. Jessica, wait here. What? So I'll be the only one left out? Nice try, but I'm going too. Yeah, it might be better that way. If the goal of that phone call was to split us up further, it wouldn't be good to leave someone to watch this room. There's no time to argue. Let's all go. I got to rifle high and took the lead. I couldn't go unarmed myself. I found a three-pronged candle stand and readied it. Fuck is that gonna do? Although the pins on it use although the pins on it used to fit candles were short. It was almost like a three-pronged spear. I'm oh, sorry if I seem a bit tired. It's 9 p.m. I was not planning on starting this recording this damn late, but I just needed to see what happened next before I went to bed. Then the four of us left the study. We left the study which should have been the safest place inside the mansion. By doing this, we had been lured out, even though we had barricaded ourselves in a safe closed room. Perhaps we were doing exactly the same thing Grandfather had done when he disappeared from that room. Maria! Maria! Where are you? Answer me! I listened closely but didn't hear anything. The mansion was vast, and since the passing typhoon was making its last stand, the sound of the rain was even noisier than before. Maria said she wanted to watch TV in the parlor, right? Let's try, go let's try going downstairs. That's right. Let's try there. Everyone, be mindful of your surroundings. Yeah! With Unnatsui in the center, her rifle readied and her finger on the trigger. We moved in a group, our backs together, checking our surroundings in all directions. It was just as though the magic of the magic circle designed to spread discord had worked. 
We have split up. And furthermore, I've been dragged out into dangerous territory. In other words, even now, we were doing just what the culprit wanted us to do. This was a separate world where it couldn't be out there where it wouldn't be odd for anything to suddenly occur. I nods we nervously pointed the barrel of the gun at every dark spot and shadow. It felt like that motion was out of fear rather than caution. But the rifle she held in her hand could should have been a trump card that the culprit feared. You know I've been thinking. It wouldn't be impossible to stick one of those ice picks into someone's chest like in Kanon's case. But splitting the skull and sticking them in the forehead like my parents' case wouldn't be that easy. You think the culprit had that kind of animal strength? They probably had some kind of weapon, a device that can shoot or pound in those ice picks. That handle was too short to be driven that deeply by a human strength alone. Either way, they have enough force to break through a skull. I heard Kana's wound reached as far as his lungs. If you happen to see your opponent, don't go forward. You mustn't move away from my back. Just how sinister and frightening was the weapon that could shoot those creepy ice picks? And could I do anything to combat it with just this candle stand in my hand? In the first murder, the COVID probably assaulted all four of our parents at once as they discussed the inheritance problem in the dining hall. And there are four of us here now. Apparently, I wasn't the only person thinking this. George, Jessica, and of course, Aunt Natsuhi were stretching their senses to the utmost limit and the highest and worst state of tension, slowly advancing one step than another. Ah, uh, what have we done? Because of the seeds of doubt spread by that one letter, we threw Maria and the rest into the middle of this terrifying world. We finally reached the first door. The parlor was just across the hall. When we listened carefully, we could hear it faintly. Maria's eerie singing voice. She wasn't singing naturally as though she were in a good mood. She was singing mechanically, like she was at a graduation ceremony or she'd been ordered to. The song she sang was just a common folk song. One that everyone had probably sung in school at one time or another. But why that? But why that? In the middle of the night, alone, with all their heart, over and over. Why? Right after leaving the study, we are called out in loud voices asking where Maria was. But this time, not even a single word said. But this time, no one said even a single word. We hid our breath in the sound of our footsteps and intensely focus on our surroundings to the point of being completely high strung. We stepped forward. The doors of the parlor was closed, but we could hear Maria's singing voice through it. Unknocked, we put her hand on the handle of the doorknob when George stopped her. I'll open the door. Unknocked, we battle and ready your weapons. Understood. Take care. They might attack as soon as we open it. George, watch yourself. Sure. Then I'll open it. Huh? He tried to open it, but immediately felt the hard resistance of the lock. Unnoticed, we took the bundle of keys from our pocket and gave them to George. There were about 10 keys, and none of us had a clue which was which. Because of this, George had to fumble around loudly and test several of the keys. Since we had hidden our footsteps, preparing to make a surprise attack on the room, this felt almost fatal. The whole time we could hear Maria's voice from the parlor singing the same song over and over. It was like a broken, crazy cassette tape. We'd been in that room almost constantly since early, since morning. All the frightening things had occurred outside that room. That had left us with the impression that only this room was safe. That baseless, that baseless impression was quickly falling apart. It's open. Thank you. George, Jessica, move behind me. Anatsui, let's jump in at the same time and split up in different directions. If we just stand around after opening the door, those ice picks might fly right through the center. I agree. Ready? 
<laughs> I really wish I could say no. I readied myself. If they're gonna be throwing ice picks, I'll whack them with this candle stand. Go! Ugh, creepy ass. Aunt Natsui and I rammed into the door before flying into the parlor. Quickly splitting up left and right and searching the parlor for someone who might be waiting for us. But what our eyes landed upon was an incredibly strange sight. The parlor was stained with blood. This place where we spent almost the entire day. But we pressed in together to protect ourselves from some unknown malice. Had been stained in fresh blood and had become an ocean of blood. On the floor lay Genji, Kumasawa, and Dr. Nanjo. Their entire bodies stained bright red with the blood. But the only way we could identify them was by their clothes. That was because... Ah, that's right. This is how the whole tragedy started. Their faces. Just like our smashed up parents in the shed. You couldn't tell where their eyes stopped and their noses began. It was as though they'd been rudely... Like, it's all, as though they'd rudely plunged their faces into tomato pies. All squished to... Ah! And that wasn't all. Their bodies had other wounds. It was those demon ice picks. They were in Genji's stomach. Dr. Nanjo's thigh. No, his knee. That's right, of course, it's his knee. In the epitaph, the sixth twilight was the stomach. The seventh was the knee. So after seeing one of them struck near Kumabawa's, Kumasawa's calf, I couldn't help masochistically laughing. Ah, that's right. On the sixth twilight, gouge the stomach and kill. On the seventh twilight, gouge the knee and kill. On the eighth twilight, gouge the leg and kill. Ah, now even the eighth twilight is over. And the next one, the ninth twilight, what was it again? Maria was there. She was facing the wall in the inner part of the room, standing stock still, completely alone. She faced away from this horrible scene, standing by the wall, singing her song over and over. There was nothing else in the room. Just the corpses of the three who had been brutally killed. The phone receiver, which was still off its hook, proving that this was the room the call had came from. Just that and Maria, her back to the scene as she kept on singing while facing the wall. We couldn't even scream at this bizarre scene. We could only stare, shocked with our mouths hanging loosely open. Maria! <laughs> Jessica called out to her, but Maria showed no reaction. Alone, she kept singing on and on. We had come here trying to save Maria from some approaching danger. So now the way I found her, we should have been running up to Maria, hugging her, joyous that she was safe. And yet, not one of us could do that. Everyone thought it, but they couldn't say it. After all, because, because, that's right. Even if that's crazy, no, it couldn't be. Maria, stop singing. Are you listening? At some point, Anatsui and I pointed our weapons at Maria's back. I yelled at Maria in a violent voice. But there was no reaction. She just kept singing. With the candle stand still ready, I ran up to her and forcefully, no, violently slammed my hand down on her shoulder. Then I pulled on her shoulder, forcing her to turn around. <laughs> Maria's small body was quickly pulled down and fell. And as though, unha and as though unhappy at having her singing interrupted, Mario looked into my face with the usual expression. Even in this gruesome scene, she was just like normal. Maria, Maria, what is this? Who did it? Beatrice. Cut that crap! I threw the candles and I've been holding against the wall. The violence of that reckless sound should have gone straight into Maria's heart. 
But Maya's expression didn't change at all. Quit it battling! Maria, this time you've seen the face of the culprit who killed these three. Was the culprit the same Beatrice who gave you the letter? Beatrice! Well, in that case, it's certain. There's a 19th person. Beatrice does exist. Then Maria, will you at least tell me this much? How did they kill these three people? What did they use to kill them in such a brutal way? I don't know. How could you not know? It happened in this room! Are you trying to tell me you were so absorbed in singing that you didn't notice? Calm down, battler. Maria, talk to me, okay? George, as he always did, crouched down next to Maria so that their eyes met and talked to her very kindly. Maria, why were you facing the wall and singing? Beatrice said face the wall and keep singing for a long time. So, did Beatrice come here? Were Genji and the rest still alive then? Everyone came into the parlor together and sat down. Genji made sure to lock the door. It was locked when we got here, but then, how did Beatrice get into the parlor? Beatrice is a witch, so locks don't matter. She turned into butterflies and came into the crack in the door. Calmly joking at a time like this? Like hell that happened? What are you saying? You can't believe it? That's why I didn't want to say it. No matter how I say it, you won't believe. But Beatrice is a witch. She can do anything with her miraculous magic. That's why Beatrice doesn't care whether her door is locked or not. And then, after Beatrice appeared, what happened to everyone? Beatrice talked to us. She said Grandfather Steiner was protected by a powerful force. And she couldn't answer no matter what she did. So she told us she'd select three sacrifices from the four people in the parlor. Everyone said no way. Kumasawa wept. Kumasawa kept saying no way, no way. But Beatrice chose. And when she did, Beatrice said I'd be fine. Why do you think? It's because of the scorpion charm with the fifth magic circle of Mars. The one Battler used to pray for my safety. The one he put his feelings into. Because of that power, Beatrice couldn't do anything to me and me alone. So she decided to use the other three as sacrifices. After that, Beatrice spoke. Come. Face the wall and sing a song for me. You will sing lots and lots of songs. So no matter what happens, no matter what you hear, you won't hear, you won't hear what you won't know. Come, let's sing lots of fun songs for me. So I was singing the whole time, over and over. So I didn't hear anything, didn't know anything. And then all of you came. Are you asking us to believe that? You think we're stupid? <laughs> then who will you suspect this time? Will you suspect me? Gonna try killing me here? Even if you do that, Beatrice won't stop existing. Now the 8th twilight is over and Beatrice will revive. Are you serious? I've had enough of that talk! As if witches could exist! As if I let myself get tricked! I won't accept it. Beatrice doesn't exist. I definitely won't accept it. So I won't let her exist. I won't let her revive. The legend will remain a legend forever. I won't acknowledge something like that. Quit it, battler. It's not like Maria killed them or let them die. Beatrice came and Maria had to obey. Was unable to resist. Uh, Natsuhi. She isn't here. Huh? What? M Mom, where did she go? Just now, she left by herself reading a letter. A letter? That makes sense. The culprit must be so exhilarated now that we've reached the 8th twilight. They might have left the letter so they could brag even more. 
Were, the, were we so wrapped up in questioning Mari that we forgot to look for a letter? But even as well armed as she was, why had she left the room by herself in this dangerous mansion after reading it? Jessica tried to chase after her and tug at the handle door, but it resisted strangely and wouldn't open. M Mom! Mom! What's going on? Open up! Open up! It was only natural. Not so we had picked up the candle stand which Battler had thrown at the wall which it, and which fall, had fallen on the floor. She then skillfully wedged it between the doorknobs of the, on the double doors like a bolt holding them closed. The intricate design of the candle stand caused it to get caught solidly and it really did make a sturdy seal on the door. A tragic screen of a daughter for her mother. Did it reach Natsui's ears or not? Fucking hell, oh my goodness. Natsui's figure was alone in the entrance hall. It was the place decorated by the portrait of Beatrice. Not so we threw down Beatrice's last letter, the one she'd read in the parlor, ready to rifle again, and in a voice that rang clear, yelled in a massive space that was the entrance hall. I am Ushiro, I am Ushiro Miyanatsuhi, representative of the Ushiro Miya family. Show yourself, Golden Witch Beatrice. The entrance hall was dimly lit, other than a faint light which shone on the center of the room. Everything was blotted out by the jet black darkness. In that darkness, butterflies glittering in gold squirmed and twinkled and sneered. Now as we gave one more huge gulp and pointed the cold barrel of the gun at the golden butterflies. So you are finally shown yourself I still can't believe that something like you really exists but that isn't a problem both I who bear the title of representative to the Ushura Mia family and you who claim to succeed the headship of the Ushura Mia family are here right now at this point whether you are a witch or not is a trivial matter Come, let us settle this. Which of us will truly succeed the Ushira Mia family? Don't get fucked up, Natsuhi. Natsuhi, don't get fucked up. Like, a lot of the other deaths fucked with me, but like, if you die, that will genuinely just fucking kill me, bro. Don't get fucked up, Natsuhi. I, Ushira Mia Natsuhi, or you, Beatrice. Allow me to respectfully accept your request for a duel. Don't get fucked. You're gonna get fucked up. You can't handle her. You can't handle her, Natsuhi. You're not built for this. The gold butterfly slowly formed a human shape, which walked into the dim light. Natsuhi readied the rifle and glared. The witch raised her golden staff overhead and laughed. Natsui's finger slowly squeezed the trigger. And go! Battler made an all-out dash at the door and rammed into it, crushing the candle stand that had been that had been barring it and making it possible for a big gap to be opened in the door. He kept kicking the candle stand through that gap and the door was finally released. At that time, they heard it. They certainly heard the crisp sound of a gunfire ring out once. Mom! Jessica, you mustn't run off by yourself. Was that the sound of a gun just now? Did I not so we shoot? At whom? At the culprit? The noise had come from the entrance hall. And the entrance hall looked like a stage. Like the heroine of a tragedy on the ground and bathed in light. Arrayed in the beauty of that silence. 
Anansui lay face up, crumpled on the floor. Half crazed, Jessica ran up to Aunt Natsui on Aunt Natsui's forehead. It was almost as though a sparkling shard of pigeon blood ruby had been placed there. And from in one stream of blood makeup passed by her eye and began to traverse her face. The faint smell of gunpowder smoke came from the barrel of the rifle on Natsuki still grasped. Huh? Then, then, she shot herself in the forehead. Why? Mom, mom, mom! I don't get it. Why did Natsuki run away alone? And why did she shoot through her own forehead? Maria! Anatsui left the room after reading a letter, right? There's no letter here! Damn it! What did Anatsui read and why was she lured out here? I don't know! I don't know! Who cares about that? What the hell? Why did she kill herself? Why did she leave me all alone? Jessica clung to her mother's corpse, crying earnestly. My body was consumed with an anger I didn't know what to do with, and I snatched the rifle from Aunt Natsui's hand. I spun around, pointing the barrel of the gun in the darkness of, into the darkness on all sides, as though I was pointing a light from the lighthouse trying to find the culprit. George, even in this situation, was trying to calmly figure something out, but that must have might have been a fruitless effort and only Mario was completely indifferent. So is all, this all supposed to be some kind of predetermined fate? No, that's not it. This is all a prelude to a wonderful world. The door to the Golden Land will finally open. On the ninth twilight, the rich shall revive, and none shall be left alive. And on the twelfth twilight, twilight at the journey's end, you shall attain the power of the Golden Land's treasures once and for the last time. With this, everything is over, Beatrice. Congratulations, congratulations. So lead me, lead me to the golden land you told me of, right now. There, all the dead will be revived and even lost love will be restored. So in Maria's eyes, it's just as though all of today's tragedies didn't happen. It's as though all the time she spent deprived of love never happened. Stop it! What's so fun? What's to be congratulated? There were 18 people on this island. 14 are dead. Only the four of us are left. I'm definitely not gonna die. Until this night's over. No! Until the typhoon passes and the seagulls gather again at the harbor. I'm definitely not gonna die. I'll stay alive. I'll stay alive no matter what. Give it up, battler. Guns are useless against witches. Survival and all that stuff doesn't matter because it's over. The journey is already ended. See? Look at the clock. Huh? The clock? Hearing those words, I looked at my wristwatch. Both needles were almost touching near the top. Very soon, it'll be 12 at night. In other words, 24. When you think about it, isn't 24 a strange time? It can be called 24, and it can also be called zero. The hour at the culmination of the previous day, and at the same time, it's hour zero, as the next day begins. <laughs> Beatrice! Maria suddenly called out happily and ran towards the darkness. It was almost as though Beatrice was somewhere in that darkness and Maria was running up to her. As Jessica hugged her mother's corpse, as George stood there confused, I looked down the barrel of the rifle, gazing into the darkness. The space in front of the Beatrice portrait lay in that direction, and the thing Mario was running up to was the portrait's subject. You've got to be kidding me. This is just impossible. Like I'd fall for something like this. Witches don't exist. I won't accept it. Something like you shouldn't exist. 
Because this is a human world. You think I can accept something that's not human? I definitely won't accept it. When I pulled hard on the rifle's lever, the cartridge was ejected, fell on the floor, and a new cartridge was loaded. Then I sighted the witch down the barrel. Mario turned around. Still clinging to the golden witch, he turned around. Didn't I tell you it was meaningless? Mere lead bullets are meaningless against Beatrice. Humans are so stupid, aren't they? I won't accept the existence of witches! Who are you? Just move in one step! Just try moving one finger! I'll blast you away! As the witch, no, the witches laughed. Even the large clock in the hall joined in on their laughter. It was probably telling us that the time was 24. It was a, it was both a tone telling us, it was both a tone telling us that we'd reached the culmination of this day, and a tone informing us that we had all, that all had returned to nothing. The rule that the witch would win when time ran out had already been revealed. Battling. George, Jessica, the journey is ended and the witch has revived, see? And none shall be left alive. The witch shall praise the wise and bestow four treasures. One shall be all the gold from the golden land. One shall be the resurrection of all the dead souls. One shall be the resurrection of the love that was lost. One shall be to put the witch to sleep for all time. Sleep peacefully, my beloved witch Beatrice. The storm passed and the leaden clouds that had enshrouded the island for so long cleared away. From the rifts between the clouds, sunbeams shone and yesterday's storm seemed like a lie. Just as someone had wished, the seagulls returned to the harbor once again and let their lively cries be heard. Afterwards, the police came and conducted an investigation on the scene. The corpses of the children, who were thought to have survived until the very end, were never found. However, because of the body parts that were discovered and the unimaginably gruesome nature of the scene, the police were forced to conclude that the chances of survival for any of the 18, even the children, seemed hopelessly dim. Just how gruesome was the banquet of the witch, and how beautiful was the golden land, they were the only ones who got to hear that tale. No tales were told to those humans who arrived after the banquet was over. The best they could do was imagine what might have happened during those two days. However, the witch was fickle. She made a point of leaving behind this tale, which didn't need to be heard and was allowed to be spread. Then many years later, a strange wine bottle that had drifted on the waves of the pier of the neighboring island was pulled out by a fisherman. Inside it was a thin, tightly rolled notebook fragment written upon in cramped letters, written there was his tale. Through the notebook fragment, people finally learned the truth of the mysterious and riddle-filled two-day period on October 4th, 1986. This incident was later called by many names such as the Rock and Jima mass murders, eight killers of Rock and Jima, seven the land, fuck! Lovers of the occult claim that it was a result of an immortal ceremony that sealed off the island, fuck! However, not one of these interpretations approach the truth, fuck! Furthermore, while the notebook fragment describes this mysterious incident, it does not reveal the truth of what happened here. Or maybe the writers didn't know what the truth was. According to the writer, her name was Ushira Miyamaria. Incidentally, as a result of the all-out police investigation, part of Maria's body and a piece of her jaw was discovered. It was one of the rare instances where a corpse was identified thanks to dental records. At the gruesome scene, there had been body parts of- Okay, okay, jaw unfortunately fine. 
The jaw separated from the body. Police judge the sentence survival hopelessly damned, even though none of the other body parts were found or at least identified. And so let us conclude this tale with the final selection of the notebook fragment that Oshiro and Miyamaria left behind. By the time you have read this, I'll probably be dead. Although there may or may not be a corpse, you who have read this, please find out the truth. That's my only wish. Ushira Miyamaria. To this very day, the truth of the witch legend serial murders has not been brought to light. First game, Legend of the Golden Witch Result. Damn, Kraus died on the first twilight. Rudolph died on the first twilight. Kyrie died on the first twilight. Chosen by the key. Chosen by the key. Chosen by the key. On the second twilight, pierced by the stake of Asmodeus. Hideyoshi, pierced in the forehead by the stake of Beelzebub. Kenzo, forehead gouged by the stake of Mamon. Cannon, chest gouged by the stake of Satan. Genji, stomach gouged by the stake of Lucifer. Nanjo, knee gouged by the stake of Belagor. Kumasawa, leg gouged by the stake of Leviathan. Which Beatrice finally opens the door to the Golden Land, revived. Ushiramiya died. Which raised the nobility, granted or something. George, after he acknowledged the existence of the witch, he prostrated himself, invited him. Jessica invited him. Ushiramiya invited him. Will the witch invite this man who did not died? Will the witch invite this man who denied her existence in the Golden Land? The witch will praise the wise. George shows his lost fiance. Jessica chose the boy she liked and lost. Mario chose the lost love of her mother. Sleep peacefully, Beatrice. Let nothing disturb your slumber ever again. The winner is the Golden Witch Beatrice. Time ran up before even one of the 18 people could solve the riddle of gold. All 18 died when the seagulls cried, none were left alive. Fuck! Fast ass text, I can't read like that. I'm illiterate. Shit. That's fucked up though, man. That's fucked up. She ain't have to do my niggas like that, dog. Like on some real shit. She ain't have to do my niggas like that. Additional new features. The Golden Witch has prepared a gift for you in the commemoration of your stay. You can find these new features on your title screen. Fuck! You've done made it this far if you enjoyed your stay. The Golden Witch has granted you an invitation to a tea party. We hope you choose to... Found in the parlor, weapon resembling a nice pick out of his stomach. His face has been smashed. At the sixth twilight, gouge the stomach. Gouge the leg. Where is it? Is it the same for Nanjo? Yeah, I gouge the knee. How impudent of her to challenge a witch with nothing but a mere gun. Of course she'd end up like this. Okay, so my theory, I had a theory earlier. I didn't say it, but I had a theory last episode that it was actually Maria who was saying these things here, these things down here was Maria's two cents basically, right? What she thought about the situation. And my main reason was this right here. And also the fact that, you know, the key, the dumbass laugh, that was my theory. But seeing um this right here basically confirmed it for me. Basically confirmed it for me right there. This Mario that's adding their fucking two cents to this shit. That's all I really wanted to see though. I was just curious about that still. And I wanted to see if it said anything interesting like it did for all the other ones. But honestly, the way, depending on how you see it, the fact that it just follows the epitaph is creep, it's, that's still creepy as fuck, honestly. Episode one, Tea Party. I mean, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do any of this shit, really. I just wanna see what it is. Just look at it right quick. Purgatorio. Congrats on finishing Umi Neko. Man, I still don't have a clue what was going on when the story ended. 
So this fool made the world where everyone could be happy all come to nothing. Though Beatrice is extremely angry, she also seems to be enjoying herself immensely. It's almost like she's been waiting a thousand years to get her hands on a toy as fun as this. Hopefully even this fool will be able to see you before long. Missing. Missing. Even though everyone was getting along so well after being reunited in the Golden Land, all of the magic came to nothing because of some certain hard-headed fool. Afterwards, the demons chewed him to the bone and he went to hell. Damn, what did he do? Missing. Even though she was given a precious invitation to the Golden Land, a single fool refused to believe in the witch and all the magic disappeared. She was then chewed to bits by the demons and went to hell. Battler! Come on, man! <laughs> Come on, man! You got everybody chewed to bits and sent to hell! <laughs> Come on, Battler, do better! Next episode, we're gonna do the tea party. And then after that, I guess we're going to get into episode two. I don't know how long this should take, but it'll probably get its own episode. Um, yeah. It'll probably take a while after the tea party for me to start on episode two, since I have a lot of other shit that I want to get into and finish um, recording. But holy fuck. That was a, a crazy ass, crazy ass first episode. Like, I don't think I've ever been this fucking baffled by some shit ever in my life like dead ass so that's the end of the episode man peace out i love y'all tap into the next one this shit was fucking crazy love y'all man